With African Americans voting overwhelmingly for the party of Lincoln, it was hardly surprising that Republicans were able to control the governments in almost all these reconstructed states. While most of the Republican office holders were white, for the first time a significant number of African Americans gained political positions. Eager to modernize the South, these administrations moved quickly to implement Republican policies of aggressive government action. They began building schools to bring public education to the region and railroads to help modernize the economy. While they achieved some success, to finance these projects they dramatically raised taxes. In a region that was already devastated by war, this proved to be economically unsustainable. Conservative Democrats, calling themselves Redeemers, began to chip away at Republican control of the South. They noted that a significant number of these politicians were from the North, and they scornfully referred to them as carpetbaggers, implying that these Northerners had simply come to the South in order to loot it. They likewise termed the large number of white Southerners who supported the Republican Party as scalawags, suggesting that they were corrupt traitors to the true interests of the South. Finally, the Democratic Redeemers condemned the Republicans as the party of blacks, suggesting that any white who voted for them was betraying his race. Over time, these arguments gained traction. Immediately after the war, a large number of white Southerners had supported the Republican Party. Many of these were poorer Southerners who had come to resent the control which the planter aristocracy had wielded over the region. They hoped that under Republican governments, they would gain opportunities which they had been denied to before, such as access to education. However, growing taxes, continued economic chaos, and the reality of considerable corruption in these governments increasingly discouraged them. Racial arguments also proved highly effective in dissuading white voters from voting Republican, and black voters were discouraged from participating in politics through intimidation and violence. By the late 1870s, the Republican era in the South had ended, and the Democratic Party reigned supreme. Under the Redeemers, the South returned in many ways to the political pattern it had exhibited prior to the war. While the planter class had been diminished, they were still strong and able to exert tremendous influence. Continuing to uphold Jeffersonian principles of limited government, they lowered taxes and curbed efforts to use public agencies to influence the economic or social development of the region. The continued dominance of the planter class also ensured that the economy remained largely static, Having made their living for generations growing crops like cotton, they saw no reason to change. Well into the 20th century, the southern economy was primarily agricultural, lagging far behind the north in terms of modernization and industrialization. Social patterns also remain reminiscent of the pre-war south. The end of slavery had been a momentous step forward for African Americans. No longer would they be denied the right to be married or learn how to read or write. They could form families without the fear that their spouses or children would be sold away from them. They could create their own churches where they worshipped as they pleased. Under the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Acts of 1866, 1871, and 1875, they had been assured that they would have the rights of American citizens and that the federal government would protect these rights. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1870, had absolutely guaranteed them the right to vote. Yet in reality, African Americans continued to suffer from discrimination. A key problem was the lack of economic opportunity. The Civil War had ended slavery and increased the social and political rights of African Americans, but the federal government had not redistributed land. In an economy that remained overwhelmingly agricultural, this meant that the freedmen were forced to continue to work as agricultural laborers on land owned by others. African Americans did have some power, they had some choice in terms of who they worked for, and they used this power to negotiate what they believed would be a better deal. Rather than working on a, in a labor gang under the supervision of an over overseer, the typical organization of work under slavery, more and more planters divided their estates up into individual family farms and leased them out to the freedmen. In most cases, the renters paid not in cash, but with a share of the crop. African Americans hoped that under this system they would be able to accumulate enough surplus cash to buy their own land and become independent farmers. For some it did work out this way, 
but for the overwhelming majority, sharecropping proved to be an economic trap. Plantation owners insisted that they grow only commercial crops, like cotton, not food to feed their families. To survive until harvest time, then, the sharecroppers had to purchase food from local merchants. Having little cash, they purchased goods on credit and were charged exorbitant rates of interest. This, combined with declining prices for cotton, ensured that a large percentage of sharecroppers ended up deeply in debt, unable to accumulate any surplus capital to buy their own land. African Americans also suffered from severe setbacks to their civil and legal rights. The federal government had made a serious effort to guarantee these rights through constitutional amendments and laws. For instance, to counter the growth of organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan, which sought to use violence to prevent African Americans from voting, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1871, which authorized the use of federal troops to suppress these terrorist organizations. Likewise, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875 in an attempt to prevent southern states from passing laws segregating public accommodations. Over time, however, these efforts waned. By the mid-1870s, the Democratic Redeemers had largely been successful in destroying the Republican Party in most southern states. These Redeemers tenaciously resisted federal efforts to regulate social relationships. The U.S. Supreme Court also invalidated or limited congressional attempts to protect the civil rights of African Americans. The Civil Rights Cases of 1883, for instance, ruled that the federal government could not outlaw racial discrimination by private individuals and organizations. Among other results, it crippled the federal attempt to suppress the Ku Klux Klan, since it was a private organization. In 1890, in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, the court further limited the protections offered by the 14th Amendment by ruling that segregation, the provision of separate public facilities for blacks and whites, was constitutional. By the mid-1870s, many in the North were simply weary of the long struggle to reshape the South and increasingly more interested in dealing with other issues, such as the collapse of the national economy in 1873. This weariness set the stage for the Compromise of 1877. In the election of 1876, the Democratic candidate for president, Samuel J. Tilden, secured a clear majority of the electoral votes. However, his victory was challenged based upon charges of electoral fraud in several southern states, notably Florida. In fact, in several instances, southern Democrats had used violence and intimidation to suppress the Republican vote, violence directed mostly at African Americans. A special electoral commission established by Congress awarded the disputed votes to the Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes. Furious, Northern and Southern Democrats vowed to resist this decision, but their protests were cut short by an informal agreement. In return for not disputing the findings of the commission, the Republicans essentially promised to cease efforts to enforce civil rights legislation in the South, and that they would provide federal funds to help rebuild the shattered region. This compromise marked the end of the Reconstruction era. With the federal government no longer actively seeking to protect their rights, African Americans suffered a sharp decline in their fortunes. While slavery was indisputably dead, new forms of discrimination sprang up to replace it. By the late 19th century, a system of segregation had emerged that helped keep African Americans at the bottom of the social ladder in the South. By the early 20th century, most Southern states had also found ways around the 15th Amendment's guarantee of voting rights. Through the use of devices such as the poll tax or the understanding clause, they disenfranchised most black voters. The Civil War and the Reconstruction era had changed many things in the United States, but there remained many long years before the legacy of the slave system would truly begin to fade. <laughs>